Management Webinar Series. Today's presentation is the first in a series of risk management webinar conferences, web conferences brought to you by Crane and Rigging Hotline and Houston International Insurance Group. My name is Katie Parrish, Editorial Director of Maximum Capacity Media and publisher of Crane and Rigging Hotline and your host for today's conference. So why focus on risk management? For starters, it's a topic that affects all areas of your business and requires planning ahead to ensure your business is covered from every angle. With this series, Crane and Rigging Hotline and HIG have developed a range of topics that will help you prepare for foreseen risks, estimate their impact, and define responses to these issues. Additionally, this webinar series will help you establish a plan and a risk strategy that includes avoiding, controlling, and mitigating, accepting, and transferring risk. If you have an idea for a specific area you would like us to cover in a future webinar, feel free to email me at the address on this page, and I'll also post my contact information again at the end of this presentation. Today's topic will look at minimizing liability allocation after a main, major crane accident. In this webinar, Kevin Cunningham, president of HIG Construction, will help, you, will help you understand how OSHA's new enforcement tools will impact liability allocations and future crane-related accident litigation. Kevin has 30 years of experience in heavy industrial insurance and risk management, formerly working as a Lloyd's of London cover holder underwriter and crane insurance program manager on behalf of Lexington Insurance Company, Travelers Insurance Company, and National Interstate Insurance Company. Today, he is president of HIG Construction, a division of Houston International Insurance Group, where he's responsible for all business development and overall risk management services for crane, pile driving, foundation, and related heavy civil construction segments. This topic is broad ranging, drawing attention from newspapers, websites, attorneys, and government entities. Sources from Kevin's presentation include OSHA, industry publications including ENR, an Occupational Safety and Health Reporter, national news organizations, law offices in New York, Florida, Kansas, Massachusetts, Illinois, and more. He will provide more details on specific articles and court cases in his presentation. If you have questions about this presentation or general insurance questions, Kevin, Kevin's contact information was included in on this page, and uh, it will also be available again at the end of this presentation. A little bit about our sponsor, Houston Insurance in International Insurance Group, or HIG, is an international insurance carrier that operates four wholly owned major insurance companies, underwriting in more than 30 countries worldwide. Earlier this year, HIG reorganized its domestic underwriting operations to better serve the industry's needs. For more information, visit HIG's website at www.hiig.com or contact Kevin who, has, who can specifically help you with your heavy industrial insurance and risk management needs. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to thank you again for attending. Uh, this is a first go for us and we're really excited about having you all on board. If you have a question during the presentation, please type them into the chat box on your screen. We'll do a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Kevin's slides will also be available after the presentation, and follow-up information will be sent to you later this week or early next week on specifics of this topic, including case law files, which he'll cover in his presentation. Additionally, this presentation is being recorded and can be accessed on the Maximum Capacity Media YouTube channel at youtube.com slash maxcapmedia or Crane and Rigging Hotline's website www.cranehotline.com. That information will be provided again at the end of the, rev uh, at the, end of the webinar. Um, and now I'd like to pass over the controls to Kevin. Kevin, please begin whenever you're ready. Thanks, Katie, and thank you all for attending. All right, we have a significant amount of information to cover, and so we'll just jump into it. All right, table of contents, we'll do a little overview and then we're going to talk about some key considerations and those being controlling entity, multi-employer worksite liability doctrine, ground conditions, rigging, signal person, and then how these new OSHA crane rules can work to your advantage. The whole objective of this workshop discussion is to figure out ways to minimize your liability allocation when it is warranted. And we've got some conclusion statements and a bibliography for reference material. And then we'll go to Q&A. 
Right. So today, uh, before we start, we need to clarify that there has been a lot of newsworthy topics about uh, OSHA and industry uh, representatives with these new standards. Um, I have been involved with a committee in, involved with OSHA and have recently met with Jim Maddox, the director of construction. And Jim has made it clear that the that only the operator certification mandate is under consideration for extension to 2017, and all the other OSHA regulations uh, are in effect and coming into effect through November of 2014. Uh, it is my personal expectation and our group's expectation that the operator certification requirement will be extended to 2017. We'll see where that goes. Other than that, uh, an overview of today's risk management workshop um, is really key keys on these several points. That several new and expanded factors with the new crane standard will result in OSHA being able to apportion fault to multiple contractors when there is major crane accidents on a multiple contractor site. Key consideration for for our industry, for our crane industry, is that the crane contractors are no longer the only target defendant as in the past with the former OSHA ANSI standards that held crane companies fully responsible for all facets involving crane operations. So OSHA will look to a broader scope to make sure that any and all parties involved actually fulfill their operational responsibilities under the new rules of law in multi-contractor sites. Uh, it is our feeling this will have a major ripple effect in how future crane accidents are investigated for civil litigation, including trying to defend any OSHA citations. Additionally, the case law will change the legal landscape involving crane accident litigation, we believe, for years to come as the new rules of law can and should spread responsibilities to other parties that have direct causation involvement in major crane accidents. The key consideration for today's discussion will involve these bullet points. Controlling entity, multi-employer doctrine, ground conditions, rigging failure, faulty signal person operations. So let's take a look at each one of these risk factors that historically have been drivers of major crane accidents. Controlling entity. This is truly historic from, from our position in the insurance industry that never before had uh, controlling entity or controlling employer as, as much of this is, is considered uh, applied to the crane industry. And now there is a new crane specific definition in the standard that goes beyond the traditional role of assigning liability only to the crane company for any and all responsibilities associated with crane operations. This will expand responsibility to other contractors that are technically quote unquote, part of the chain of responsibility. And this was created specific to crane activity on multi-employer contractor sites. So the crane specific definition that now further expands the old and former traditional multiple, multiple employer doctrine to any employer that is considered a prime or general or construction manager, and here's where it the rubber might meet the road, any other legal entity that has overall responsibility for crane operations in the construction of the project, its planning, and this is a key one, completion. So this is for your reference. We won't go through all of it, but here is the actual definition out of the Federal Register. Controlling entity means an employer that is a prime contractor, general, construction manager, or other legal entity for overall responsibility. So the, the planning, quality, and completion factors are, are opening the door uh, for some increased fairness. And what I ask you to think about as we're talking here, think about responsibilities, assuming you're a crane or pile driving entity, think about responsibilities involving excavation, 
rigging signalmen and power lines as we delve into the impact of these new regulations. Multi-employer worksite liability doctrine or MED as it is more commonly known, multi-employer doctrine, has always and still applies to all industries under OSHA law and has been in effect for 30 plus years. It's become somewhat dormant, particularly with new construction risk management techniques involving uh, indemnification, hold harmless, additional insured requirements coming from above being general contractors or primes down to, to the trades. The multi-employer doctrine principles now have a specific and additional applicability to construction and in particular work sites including cranes with multi multiple contractors involved. Additionally, power line utilities and separate rigging entities now have increased responsibility. And there is some case law that is fairly recent that, that has gone through two different uh, appeal appellate process that they were unsuccessful for the contractors, which has, has taken precedence in, in this formerly nebulous general rule of law. Secretary of Labor, OSHA, uh, and Summit contractors have been engaged in this legal battle and thus far Summit has been coming out on the, Summit is a general contractor and they have been coming out on the losing end. So we'll move forward and discuss a few of the case particulars. Without going into all the gory narratives, OSHA cited Summit as a general regarding some equipment that was rented at a multi-employer construction site and so that they were they had made a determination that Summit was liable both as the controlling entity and the creating employer for exposure to several lower tier subcontractor employees as it relates to deficient equipment and the operation of that equipment. And because the condition of the non-compliant equipment was a driving force uh, Summit attempted to, to appeal after they lost their administrative law judgment and took it to the appellate court which goes through the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. It's, it's very similar to state courts that, that then get appealed to either regionals or even up to Supreme Court levels. Um, and it's known as the Summit Contractors versus Secretary of Labor case. Um, this is a very significant decision. We use it in, in our litigation management as a major insurance carrier defending our policyholders' interests. We know other our counterpart carriers do as well. And it's now expanding the number of jurisdictions that, have, that are using it as, um, as the important case law for reference that really upholds that the general contractor's liability, a multi-employer uh, work sites is, should hold true. Here's where the rubber meets the road on this case. It suggests that general contractors may not, cannot be shielded from liability by contractual provisions delegating responsibility for work site safety to the subcontractors. It's very, um, it's a very intensive ruling against Summit. They argued that they're, they weren't responsible, they didn't have people there, and most importantly that they had a subcontract with Spring Hill that expressly stated that Spring Hill signed that they would be responsible for complying with all laws and, and OSHA situations. And OSHA ruled against it. And they used the basic premise that Summit could not contract away its overreaching uh, safety responsibilities under the OSHA Act. This will be particularly true in in others in many states, most of which are the the um, anti indemnity states, and there's a lot of litigation and change in state legislature going towards the anti indemnity that that holds contractors, general contractors, responsible that they cannot contract away their overall responsibility. So the summit contractors legal decisions reflect you know, a growing trend and uh, that there are increasing number of courts that are upholding the general contractors responsibility 
and the key consideration here is regardless of subcontracted conditions. It doesn't mean it's absolute, but it, it's, it is opening the door to, to a shared responsibility environment. So gradually, what is happening over the last few years is that more general contractors are being held accountable for general worksite safety. And now clearly in the new OSHA standards, ground conditions and power line hazards uh, are, are very imminent and are, are now clearly not solely the crane operator's responsibilities. The summit contractor's case suggests that generals and contractors will not be protected uh, from liability by simply using aggressive subcontract uh, conditions. And power line utility and other contractors equally have increased responsibility with the new standards for their operations under multi-employer related project sites. So um, ground conditions, another major factor, absolute major factor um, on behalf and in, in favor of, of crane owners. And here's why. OSHA has made a significant shift from placing the responsibility, as stated earlier, that, that came through ANSI standards and the OSHA regs that anything relating to the crane was the crane owner's responsibility, and now specifically cites that ground conditions responsibilities um, can be others based on litigation and accident scene facts um, to be discussed later in our conclusion. The controlling entity change, also a new, new addition to the, to the crane OSHA standards, um, also fits into this ground conditions and has a direct correlation to it. Uh, the controlling entity clearly is responsible for preparations necessary to ensure the ground is firm and drained and upgraded and all the right things, and has some, some new language about subsurface voids and tanks, very much in, in the crane owner's favor. This newly defined crane rule so this newly defined crane rule does connect directly with controlling entity language and multi-employer doctrine principles, which become the legal basis for challenging causation factor responsibility. A, a very important key consideration for crane companies, pile drivers and, and crane rental companies, is appropriate documentation uh, with other related contractors on the site. It, it is actually essential to be in a position to minimize your liability allocation in the event of a, a major crane-related accident. If we flip forward and take a look at the, the actual OSHA ground conditions definition, it's pretty clear. Um, they clearly define what ground conditions and supporting materials, which also clearly are are the crane owner's responsibility. However, if you look at item C, it just goes right to the controlling entity, and that controlling entity would be determined in an accident scene investigation and legal proceedings. If, in fact, there is no controlling entity on the project, then, then it's a different story, and that would typically apply to a single pick, um, a mobile crane that that uh, lifts a, an air conditioning unit and there really isn't anybody else, so it, it would, the responsibility would fall to the crane owner. But the, the technical definition now opens the door for uh, shared responsibility, particularly to ground conditions that didn't exist before. That is, uh, that is a significant move in favor of, of the crane industry. Here's an example, a little bit of an illustration of an example. The ground conditions, and some of this language is right out of the standard, that the soil is not fill or backfill, mud or peat. You, you can read through it, um, but if we just look at the, the two little pictures, um, the compaction, sir, clearly not, not, re, not a crane owner's responsibility. He's got to go according to his specs, and the specs clearly would have stated that the compaction would be appropriate. In the firmness, as it gets closer to the hole, looking in the top illustration, again, in the past would have been the responsibility of a crane owner. Um, today, it isn't when the appropriate documentation and 
job bidding and all the rest of that holds true. If you look at that second illustration, that void, that period between uh, that, that uh, section of ground between uh, where the crane is positioned and where the excavation is, is critically important to the crane industry. Um, when they're involved with excavation related projects or laying pipe or, or anything relating in, in those areas, the closer you get to the hole clearly creates exposure that in the past again would have been the crane owner's responsibility. And as long as there is documentation that, that you have cons that there has been consultation with the qualified person, which is the project site owner or general or prime contractor's responsibility um, and no longer the crane owner's responsibility, uh, it opens the door to liability allocation in favor of the crane. The other key factor is general contractors and or excavators are solely responsible to notify crane companies of existing underground utilities relating to subsurface voids. So even an email memo from a crane company to an excavator about ground stabilization or lack of subsurface voids can trigger the controlling entity responsibility so that it is not assumed and more legal uh, activity would be required. Now we'll move into one of the other risk drivers, rigging. Pretty clear here, according to OSHA, employers must use qualified riggers during hoisting activities and then it goes through the description. Um, the challenge for all of us that are directly connected to the crane industry is the determination of quote-unquote qualified riggers. The new standard, as we assume and, and are sure that you all are very well aware of, is, is very thick and has more detail than most people can read or understand, yet qualified riggers being a major risk driver has very little clear definition. Um, and even the qualified rigger um, goes goes to a very simplified reference that, that is not clear. So crane owners can now consider the principles of multiple employer doctrine and controlling entity as it relates to a possible major accident involving apparent faulty rigging. Um, your project contract agreements very simply should specify the need for qualified rigging personnel in projects that involve any rigging of heavy structural or, or eccentric type lifts to put you in a position to be able to utilize these new provisions to protect your interest in the event of a major accident. This next screen shows what everyone is today is fully aware of and I am uh, sad they were directly involved with with this this scenario, this actual accident, but this was uh, historic in its own proportions. The, the citations from OSHA uh, regarding faulty rigging uh, was relatively historic. Um, and at that time, the, the standard hadn't changed. And technically, the crane owner would have had um, a lot of responsibility that ended up not being the case because it was so apparent that the results of the investigation showed that the rigger fail to follow the manufacturer's rules and protect steel edges and inspect the rigging and before use or discard a, you know, a damaged sling. These kinds of things in the past um, were, were just assumed that the crane owner would be the responsible party. In this case, we had an unmanned rental and, and the crane owner well, was not held responsible and, not had, and did not have any um, OSHA-related citations for this case. Um, and the rigor got got into serious legal difficulties, both in the civil courts as well as in, as in OSHA. Clearly, this accident called national attention to rigging practices, and our expectation is OSHA will be coming um, into the crane space with with a lot of attention here. So the qualification uh, of who those riggers are and, and who's touching anything that goes on the end of your hook is going to be 
uh, front and center when accidents occur on, on crane sites. The other key consideration past rigging is signal persons. According to OSHA, very similar to the rig side, a qualified signal person is required. There's a little more definition about what qualified means, but according to OSHA, the qualified signal signal person is very well defined. It's pretty clear when the operator's view is obstructed, um, you know, either the operator or the, the rigger handling the load determines that a, a signal person is needed. The qualified is is now got some teeth to it that it didn't have before. Um, understanding the operations and limitations of the equipment, including crane dynamics involved with swinging and raising or lowering or stopping loads and in particular boom deflection from hoisting loads, would be assumed to be a practical understanding. Um, that isn't always the case. So now OSHA is holding all contractors responsible that anybody involved in signal person must know and understand the relevant signal person qualification requirements as specified in several different uh, items in the standard 1926, 1419, 1422, and 1428. So there's a lot more definition coming into the fold for the other contractors, the structural steel and concrete and material providers uh, that didn't exist before. And I would ask that you consider the realm of possibilities for shared responsibility or even possibly complete risk transfer to the signal person entity versus the crane company in conjunction with multi-employer doctrine in controlling entity provisions of law as we move forward in these discussions. The signal person qualifications has, does opposite of, of rigging have some um, OSHA definition to it. Um, this is just one item. This is the qualifications item um, on your screen now. And, and it shows there's a couple there's a couple of options. The option one and option two are all these are new, uh, newly defined, more thorough explanations of who is qualified. So it would be very important for any type of crane operations uh, to agree and understand what these third party qualified evaluators rules are what those qualifications are and which ones would apply to your job and in the contracting of your work um, that, that it's spelled out very clearly. So let's get to the meat of the matter here. How can these new OSHA crane rules work to your advantage as crane subcontractors if and when major accidents occur. It is um, our clear belief that the opportunity for the crane industry to prevail in accident litigation has never been greater. There is some assumptions there, though. It, it isn't absolute that these new conditions automatically equate to shared responsibility, so we have to assume that, that Crane companies' quality control standards are in effect, and they're thorough, and they're documented. In addition to your own quality control, safety, and operational standards, a crane owner that deploys a clearly defined rapid response approach uh, can protect your company interests interest at a time of a major crane accident in one of your projects. So what we've talked about is major contributing factors, and this comes from our personal experience over the last 18 years, that, that these five items are where they come from, are where the major catastrophic accidents are, usually involve something within these five. We're, we've talked about, and, and you'll see in the solution, we, we're, we're talking about four of the five because clearly it would be rational to understand that if operator error is determined to be the proximate cause of an accident, then minimizing liability allocation would be a moot issue. 
So these top four out of the five, from our own historical and actuarial experience of major causation factors contributing to severity crane accidents, can be controlled. And now there is federal legal language. And it is our assumption that ANSI standards will go right with them as they are coming into law that rigging failure, faulty ground conditions, power line strikes, and signal person error now has a, a door opening opportunity for shared responsibility. Um, the power line strikes, we, we didn't get into one out of a matter of time. They are so significant. There's very likely a, a separate discussion or workshop on it. Um, so we haven't gotten into the responsibility other than the power line utilities now have culpability that they didn't have before. So where does that leave us? We have uh, been involved with far too many crane industry fatalities and major accidents. And ones that have utilized this basic formula um, prior to the new OSHA rules have minimized their liability allocation. Now that the new OSHA rules are in effect and coming further into effect throughout the, the next year, um, it is our belief in, in that, that every crane-related entity in the, company can, in the country can, in fact, minimize their own liability allocation if they can, ex if they can um, execute the, the bullets listed on your screen. A, a rapid response involvement between crane company staff and insurance company personnel to obtain a handful of things. Not to look for smoking guns and not to look for or, or add opinions on who may have been at fault. Just basic witness statements. What did they see? What did they hear? How far were they from, from the actual incident? Um, basic accident scene photos and then job site and equipment information, typically type of crane, when it was inspected, and, and all the normal information that you would expect to flow upon being involved with an accident. And very important, any project-specific subcontracts and or equipment rental agreements, it, if those items can be obtained within minutes or hours after major crane accident, that would be considered phase one to minimize your liability allocation. Phase two would be in your best interest to engage a crane industry specific expert witness working in collaboration with your insurance company and defense counsel. And to be rational, that, that typically happens within the first 24 hours and can happen. Can't happen immediately because project sites are all over the country. Um, but it can be done within the first 24 hours on a rational basis. And that would be considered a second phase to minimize your life, to be in a position to minimize your liability allocation. In phase two, if there is a targeted accident investigation to obtain forensic facts by the experts and technical facts as to proximate causation factors, some of which we talked about, to particular to control the controlling entity role relating to the certain risk drivers, being ground conditions, rigging responsibilities, power line hazards, signalman duties. If you can capture that information um, with experts that, that have credentials to hold up in court, um, those factors can determine the opportunity to minimize your liability allocation. And then the, the last element being utilization of, of immediately, utilization of legal counsel to drive phase one and phase two process steps can very clearly protect your attorney-client work product privileges, which can gain litigation containment advantages on behalf of the crane companies, with the objective being to minimize your liability allocation. So in conclusion, the new OSHA regs set the stage to level the playing field for crane contractors when apportioning fault at crane accident sites 
that happen to involve multiple, multiple employers, one, to engage all of those previously mentioned um, features that are now clearly in the, in the new rules of law. So general contractors, prime contractors, utilities, riggers, signal persons, excavators, these are all entities that prior to the new standard had limited responsibility involving a crane accident and now can have direct responsibility and can be held responsible for all or any of the part of the crane accidents on job sites. Um, crane, as I mentioned earlier, crane companies must be diligent in their own safety and quality control responsibilities to be in position to take advantage of the new federal rules of law under the new OSHA crane standards. So in summary, the, the opportunity is yours. Uh, there will be new case law. There, this is arguably a lawyer's dream because there's so many new opportunities and uh, we assume that there will be lawsuits uh, filed in many different directions as a result of who is ultimately responsible. But it is our belief truly the opportunity is yours to take advantage of some of the new federal standards to protect your interests. And that, uh, that takes us at about 33 minutes and we'll now open it up for for questions. Okay, great. Um, Kevin, you had some, a slide with some sources on there, if you wanted to put that up there. Just in case okay. anyone wanted to look those up, um, they're all here. And we did have the question, um, will copies of the presentation be available? Yes. If you want to put your email address in the chat box or the question box, I'm happy to email it um, this afternoon. So you'd have a copy of that as well as a video recording. Uh, I will try to get that on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours or so. Um, we do have a couple of questions here, and um, I will put Kevin and my uh, our, our contact information up again, just in case you do have some questions after the event or you want to ask a question privately. That's okay too. Um, we are getting quite a few okay email addresses. Okay, uh, first question was about the summit case, and does that apply to crane owners? Um, my, our belief is yes, it does. Uh, it, it, it would apply to a crane owner being a subcontractor because the ruling, Summit is the general contractor and um, they tried to get out of any responsibility uh, for the accident but were, held, were pulled in through the multi-employer doctrine and they were held responsible. They appealed and said their contract says we are not responsible and, uh, and the, the uh, D.C. court system said, no, that, that's not true either, you, that they, in fact, were the, the main responsible party. So as opposed to it automatically going to the crane contractor, it, it could apply if, if the crane owner is the prime, if it's their contract. But typically we see crane owners being the secondary or sub-tier contract, subcontractor. Okay, great. Under the, uh, I'm sorry, are rigor or signal person certification part of OSHA's proposed delay or are they already in effect? Uh, great, great question. Uh, it, it is only the operator certification on the delay and there still is some question on certification for those two parts, for signal and signal person and, and riggers, it would be our opinion, in fact, we give premium line item credits to crane companies that do some type of certification and validated training for riggers and signal person because it's just a, a practical application that those that do it. Um, my belief today is that it, it doesn't have an OSHA federal law re rule regarding a mandate for certification. It just has this fairly loosely defined quote unquote qualified rigor. So I guess it's anybody's best guess and you'd be better safe than sorry by getting them um, qualified through a, through a rigor certification or signal person certification entity. We've had quite a few questions about that at Crane Hotline and um, I think there was a couple editor's notes about 
about qualification versus um, certification, and I'm happy to send that to anybody who has that question too. Going back to the summit case, um, same person asked, does this apply to project owners? It does very much apply to project owners, and um, I think it's it, the, the determination would be, you know, is the project owner um, directly involved in the case, in, in the construction project? If they are simply a financier and they, they retain the general and their, their business agreement states that, that the general is responsible to do all things, then the general under that project owner would be responsible. But from what we're seeing by opening up this um, potential for liability allocation, and they've really unearthed this former formerly nebulous or dormant multi-employer doctrine and, and the summit case is what's doing it. There was nobody above summit, so they, they in fact, were the project owner um, in that case, as we understand it. So I think a project, more safe than sorry, a project owner would have increased potential liability. Okay, great. Uh, next question. If the back of a job ticket covers the concerns that you talked about in your presentation um, and the operator gets them signed, does it hold the contract uh, gets, the, gets them signed, does it hold the contractor that the crane is working for liable? And if a field hand signs it, can the contractor say he does not have the authority? I can repeat um, that if it makes sense. <laughs> I, think, I think I understand it and, and I think it's a great question. We've had some um, very significant success in that regard where a major sub project subcontract was negotiated in an office, which is typical, and then the on-site job site ticket with responsibilities uh, being clarified um, that changed that major agreement. Um, we've had two cases uh, that, that I can recall. One the job ticket worked entirely where the crane uh, contractor was not the responsible party and the other where it became a shared responsibility and this, um, this sole, uh, not sole negligence, but this sole indemnification that irregardless of, of what happens, the, the subcontractor would have to indemnify the general uh, was thrown out because they had two disparaging contracts. Job ticket said one thing, which lessened the burden on the crane owner. The subcontract said something else. And as most of them would understand, any ambiguity in contracts tends to go against the ones that that, that wrote the major the major contract. So, so I I would encourage any crane owners to continue to use the job ticket and to spell out responsibilities especially on um, utility-like projects, underground utility-like projects. Um, that's where we've seen it work in the crane owner's favor. Okay. If a crane is rented bare without the operator, does the crane rental company have any responsibility other than to make sure the crane operates properly? Um, our, our position is no. That a bare rental agreement in the, that one rigging example that was in the ENR article on New York Crane um, held that to be true, and that was prior to these new standards being in effect. That, that they go right to the maintenance records, which we would do as well, um, and if the maintenance was in accordance with manufacturer specs um, and even some witness statements and others to, to validate that the, the equipment was fine, the responsible party is the employer of the person pulling the levers or one of these others relating to ground conditions or, or other factor that could have contributed. But that, that bare lease crane owner, our experience has been, would, would not be responsible. Okay. Uh, this is a question about which standards apply to onshore upstream oil field activities, 1926 or 1910, when cranes are used. That's what they're asking. Great question. I, I'm not a, a 
true OSHA expert, and we can certainly get, get back to it and get them a firm answer. I can tell you off the cuff um, what I've heard, and I've been face-to-face -face in OSHA's office recently with Jim Maddox. Um, the discussion was about um, derricks and, and drillers, and they're going and pile drivers, and they've made it crystal clear that a crane is a crane is a crane, and therefore 1926 would apply. Um, we are very active in the oil patch business with cranes, and uh, we take the position 1926 would be most applicable. We can get we can get OSHA's uh, determination in writing for you if you'd like. Sure, um, I have the the, the uh person who asked the question, I have their name and, and email. If they want more information, we can get that to them. Okay, how can I make sure um, if a ground condition is good for work? Uh, <clears throat> good question. Uh, uh, certainly job site specifications, if it is that kind of project, should spell out the weight and capacity for whatever they're lifting, and, and that becomes the, the door opening responsibility if there is a prime utility or prime excavation contractor. The specs would say you're going to be operating on rock and clay and it can hold a 50-ton limit or whatever. Um, so I think it would go to contract so it sets forth expectation, um, but, but any you know, ground conditions ruling is really what we would do if we had a case like that was immediately deploy a geotechnical expert to say, is it rational that a 50-ton pick should be on this kind of ground that was specced out that way? Um, because that really, I think the, the concept here or the, the topic was really that prior to these new standards, the answer to this question would be, it doesn't matter, it's the crane owner's responsibility to try to figure that out. Today, it is no longer just the crane owners. So if I were that person, I would, even in an email, make sure that if you've got a 50 ton or whatever your capacity crane is being used, that somebody is communicating from the user that the ground has been determined um, to have a enough compaction to, to withstand it. Okay. Do different states allow OSHA violations as negligence, per se, in a civil action suit? Good, great question. Um, that's somewhat all over the board. Uh, we'll pick one right out of the gates. New York does not. Um, but most states, they, they won't take this, the OSHA citation um, or fine. It, it has to go to hearing and then the winner or loser. And, and once the hearing is completed, then it's public record that anybody can use. Um, but just the fact that if, a, if OSHA cites a general contractor involving a crane accident and we were involved in it, we, we would attempt to use it the best for our ability, but typically the courts, uh, it's not resolved yet. It hasn't gone through final hearing. So there's no public record, so therefore it isn't directly applicable. Um, we do know from real experience that, that the plaintiff's bar is, has become OSHA experts and ANSI experts. In fact, um, if you were to go to ANSI and look at who, who is the biggest purchaser of the ANSI B30.5, it, it is the plaintiff counsel bar. Um, so now with the new changes, uh, the expectations are that they will do the same. So there is, in some cases, it is direct. Kansas, off the top of my head, is, as I understand it, is one that if there is an OSHA proceeding and it's going down the track that the prime contractor is responsible, we would use that to defend the crane owner's interest. In others, you can't use it. We have to find a different track. And sometimes that's delay until the hearing happens when we can use it. Okay, this goes, uh, this goes back to the underground utilities or, or ground conditions. Um, in highway work where cranes are moved along the freeway alignment, does the general contractor slash crane owner have to identify where underground utilities exist 
And how is that feasible with so many moots? Great. Another great question. Our, our position is it is not the crane owner's responsibility in any way. Uh, we had a major uh, accident go in our favor um, on right off of Michigan Avenue in Chicago, as a matter of example. Um, very significant prime mechanical contractor involved, and one of the biggest name general contractors on top of that. And sure as hell, they put their outriggers out and they're doing their, their work right on the side of the road. And um, as soon as they boomed over with, with a load of uh, steel on the end of it, the outrigger pierced through the ground and the crane went through a Michigan Avenue building and people got hurt and property got damaged. Long and short of it is we were uh, fortunate to, to have access and to utilize a crane industry expert. They went right to ANSI and OSHA standards saying in no way could we have known there was a subsurface void there, that it is not our responsibility. In fact, we so we cited the, the mechanical contractor and the general, even though we had gave them ind additional insured and an indemnification, and we prevailed in that case. Um, highway work, same thing. How, how could they possibly? But the highway contractor would have specifications of historical construction project and what type of pipe is underneath the ground and what type of rock and clay is above the pipe. Um, and that's where these that's where the door opening opportunity is to say that you know, we're not the crane owner is not a highway contractor per se, that they're responsible. Okay, going back to signal person and rigor questions, um, we've got a, quite a few on these. Let's start with, um, does the general contractor have to actually review qualifications of crane companies, signal persons, rigor, operator, and then make the decision that they are acceptable and not acceptable for a project? Um, good point. I, I don't think that that's uh, rational. I mean, it's probably not practical that they could even do that. Um, this is the good and bad of the new changes, where I think it was part of the in my experience, I was part of the SCNRA CDAC subcommittee when CDAC was going through, and this was a major item for debate. And, and the issue being, um, how could you possibly keep up with it? And, but it really it, it ended up boiling down to, it can't just fall on the crane owner. It just can't. It's not rational. It's not fair. So the general contractor to then just ensure that they deploy qualified rigors, which is even today relatively ill-defined or, or signal person. Um, in our opinion, that, that's, that's why we're having this conference. It does open the opportunity to litigate more progressively to say, you are, Mr. General Contractor, sharing in responsibility, and therefore the crane owner shouldn't be the sole party. Um, I would think in some jurisdictions, again, New York being a big one, that if the general's subcontract agreement says uh, you will have qualified as determined by OSHA, and then it is proven that that, that that signal person hasn't at least gone through a couple of the steps that are defined, then the general would pass the responsibility back to, the, to that signal person. But it, uh, I can recall the CDAC discussions. We were talking in, in, the, in the concept that the, the crane is the uh, historically is the workhorse on the project, and that so many people come and go, hooking and swinging iron and concrete buckets and other material that you know we could never keep up with it. And uh, what came back from from the, the OSHA side was that. When OSHA made the determination on the new trenching standard that was prior to certainly prior to uh, for underground construction, that that industry said the same thing. That there's no way they could keep up with the new regs um, and put trench boxes in every hole that has is four feet deep, and it would, they couldn't afford the cost and all of that, trucking, hauling, all those. Um, and they actually used that analogy to say. Yes, you can, and you should, and you will, and and so now, really, that is the intent of this discussion, 
and future accident litigation is um, the general can't possibly have proven the qualifications. They can only try to contract uh, that and they have to be present and um, or have somebody present, third party or not, to do quality control assessments. Um, so it's a great question to say, how the hell can any general contractor keep up with that and, and ensure that anyone who touches the end of a, a crane hook is going to be qualified or is signaling is, is qualified? Because we're talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, our position is OSHA is the new sheriff in town. They're coming, and we, we better do something. And and. Now, any and all of this new signal person training, and if there is certification or rigor, same thing. You know, it, okay, we are right it, at 3 o'clock. Um, let's ask one more question, and if we don't get to these, I'll send them over to Kevin, and if he can answer them later on, that would be great. Otherwise, um, we, can, we can continue to ask questions today if Kevin has time. Otherwise, we can, we can do it via email. Kevin, do you have a few minutes? Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have we have the time, and we can answer any questions that come via email. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Let's go back to. Uh, we just have a handful more. Do you see or foresee the new risk allocation standard reaching back to the crane OEM? Um, yeah, possibly. I guess the you know, it would have to be an equipment failure kind of scenario. Um, but it, it has opened that door generally to multiple responsible parties as determined by experts early in the case. So the answer would have to be yes. You know, a faulty sheave or something that, that was the cause creating the, you know, the actual uh, scenario that, that drove the accident. So the answer, I would think we would take the position yes. Manufacturers now have to be more on their toes and we're sure they are. That kind of segues into the next question. How does this change affect a crane manufacturer, um, or does it? And when their involvement um, in a construction project is installing overhead cranes? Um, that's a good question. I, well, we're going to have to give that one some thought. We don't do what, or we don't do any overhead crane-related customer work. Um, but I, I have heard and, and have some business associate friends at uh, at Lee Bear and Link Belt, and, and I know that this new standard has their legal counsel uh, on their toes. And they're they're going to the manufacturers are going to beef up their their quality controls and documentation. Um, and that's about all I can answer. I do think that the manufacturers now have an, uh, a door opening opportunity that could against them, um, but I'm not certain. I don't really have any much background with overhead cranes, but I can, we can certainly try to find out for the person asking the question. Okay, great. Um, I'll uh, write down who, who, who wrote that question. This is, goes back to Summit. Um, can you tell us which part of a contract was upheld, the damages, i.e. insurance, or OSHA, or both? Um, Good question. We, we were referring only to, to the OSHA and, and we're, our claims team is, is pulling, we'll, we'll have to answer that question off record, but we'll, we'll try to get a hold of it. We do have the summons and complaint regarding the OSHA case. Um, I, I would assume if we were, or our experience with general contractors is that they will appeal it until the moon falls out of the sky because the precedent being set by this is very significant, but uh, we'll gladly follow up and get more fact for the, for the question, to answer the question. Sure. Um, how how well versed are you in in UK um, regulations, Kevin? I have a couple questions um, from the UK. Good, great question. Uh, n not at all. Tell you the truth, uh, <laughs> we enjoyed a, a great run as a seven years a Lloyd's underwriter, but it was only for North American operations and. and they certainly do things a little differently over the pond, and but we could certainly find out. We we do we write international coverage in 30 countries today, and so we have the resource. To, I can go to our international department and try to answer any questions they may have. 
Okay, they're asking about um, the the, spe the comparison of this of the regs from the UK and the US. So um, that would be the question. I'll send it over to you too. Thank you. Going back a little bit to signal persons uh, in the new OSHA rule, does it require documentation for signal person training? Uh, I think she got the rule right in front of me. It does, um, and it spells it out: audible signal, competent person. Direct channel, directly under the load. There's a six-page description of it, and we can forward that to the person asking the question. But okay. It does. If I have a qualified rigger on a job site and I'm that person's employer, isn't it true that the signal person is employed by the customer because of the borrowed servant doctrine? Um, Good question. The, the borrowed servant doctrine, my my understanding, is very similar to the multi-employer doctrine. It's been around forever, and somewhat nebulous and um, kind of in the cobwebs. Um, they are they connect, as I understand it, um, but I, I don't know that it can be an absolute determination that, that the signal person. Um, because it would, it would have to go to whatever state law first before it got to any federal. Um, but that would be a logical, that would be a progressive defense for that general that says you can't hold me responsible because they're, they're your borrowed servant, which is the purpose there. Um, we have seen and been involved with borrowed servant doctrines for crane operators that are working on behalf of others. And um, it, it, it adds complexity. Um, which just breeds deeper litigation, but um, I, I can't. I don't think I can answer that question uh, in an absolute sense. But I would gladly try if they want to send it in writing. We'll dig into our legal department and see what they how they can help us. Okay. Final question of the day. That went uh, super quick. But um, any guidelines for selecting qualified, certified signal persons or riggers? Um, yes. Yes, and we'll, we'll send that. We can put them in there. That, um, you know, they're defined by some um, subcontractor associations that have done some work with OSHA. And we got pretty pretty well done. So um, if the person will send us their contacts, we'll, we'll, we'll get you the material that we have that we're using today. Great. OK. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to thank Kevin for his time today in answering our questions and, and uh, presenting this webinar on risk management. And I'd like to thank everyone here in attendance for joining us. This is the first time we've done a risk management webinar series. If you like what you saw, we'll probably do them about quarterly. And um, if you have any questions, our contact information is on the, on the screen. Otherwise, you all have a great afternoon. Thank you, Kevin, again. And thank you for Hig for sponsoring this webinar. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.